Okay, I think we have uh, enough people. Uh, it's already recording, so FYI. Uh, so today, I'm, I'm pleased to introduce David Schorch from uh, Geysis uh, in Cologne. So it's a Leibniz Institute. So he is the team lead from Transparent Social Analytics in the Department of Computational and Social Sciences. Before he was, before joining Geysis, he was a presidential fellow at the Department of Sociology at the University of Manchester and affiliated with the Mitchell Center for Social Network Analysis, which is full of awesome people, by the way. <laughs> Including... Not anymore now. No, I think so. <laughs> no, of uh, course, just because uh, I left. You yeah, know, because so. you left, right, of course. I just got it, sorry. <laughs> uh, he has a PhD in computer science, uh, science from the uh, University of Constance um, and a diploma in business mathematics from the Kurs Ruhi Institute of Technology. Uh, he's uh, he he's a better package developer than I am. He has a, a bunch of R packages, and uh, most of them, I, I would say, all of them are cooler than mine. Uh, one especially really cool that you guys, everybody, should check out is uh, uh, Graph Layouts. Is that the name of the package? That features a, a bunch of novel ways to like visualize graphs. And uh, is that the one that has like the fun the funky arcs? Edges? <laughs> no, you, what do you mean? You mean the curved edges that, that, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, that yeah. you always do? No, that's that, that it's that's another free. one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah. Okay, so you should ah, check okay, out that's oh no, 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 that's edge bundle. That's the edge bundle. Edge bundle, bundle yeah. yeah. So here's a bunch of stuff that you have to check out for sure. And and today he'll be talking about uh, network centrality measurements. Uh, he's been uh, working on this area a, a lot. I've seen. So it's it's a pleasure to have uh, David here. So. Thank you very much. Thanks for the introduction. Yeah, so centrality is really, I just, before I can, uh, before joining the talk, I realized it's now actually 10 years that I've been working on this, uh, on and off though. So uh, it's been, I think the last five years I've done different things, but I'm now slowly going back uh, to this topic because it was never really done what we, what we started. So the work I'm presenting is mostly, uh, it's a lot of joint work with um, Ulrich Brandes, who is now was my PhD supervisor and who is now uh, running the social networks lab at ETH in, in Zurich. Um, so the talk is going to be a mixture of uh, maybe a bit heavy on the math side at times, but the, the math points are not that important. I think the key points to take away today will be uh, what the issues are with the current status of uh, centrality measurement and what um, like what kind of alternatives do exist to kind of get around the problems when, when with, with centrality. Uh, I want to start with this. We, we've already talked about this. This has, has always been my, my favorite. As a mathematician, this has always been kind of um, one of my uh, one of my favorite favorite comics uh, from XKCD. Um, people at the sociology department where I was before always got offended when I used it. Um, but yes, so so I that was during my PhD where it was like okay, actually there is now a another guy in this in this in this um, on, on this axis, and that's the network scientist and. It has been over the over the past two dec decades, specifically in the last two, two decades, that, that kind of the concept of a network has gone by in, in the in terms of how the use talks is they has gone viral kind of in, in all disciplines, right? So we have we use networks in, in physics, in chemistry, in biology, in psychology, in sociology. Everywhere we kind of find networks, and as this quote says, we kind of um, if we want to understand, uh, uh, if we if we do would understand if we do understand networks, we kind of understand how the world works. Um, this kind of uh, since since these these the, this concept went into so many directions, also means that there are a lot of like developments in different fields that are uh, maybe some of them are actually redundant because they have been done already before. Um, or uh, they are not based, not kind of in line with what has always been uh, kind of standard for for network analysis how it was before. So I still think that there is this there's still one person on the right uh, 
that is kind of the, the math side or the more technical side of networks that we need to understand. It doesn't matter where, what kind of network we are looking at, we have to understand the object network um, for, to, to understand what kind of measures we can use for it. And uh, it's, it's a bit of a, maybe a more natural science um, example that I want to start with, but it's just still to date, I think the most, most highly cited um, um, paper that used centrality uh, to uh, in as a uh, like a tool to measure something in networks. This is in uh, for protein protein interaction network. So what what is the network? It's a net. Uh, it's composed of proteins and in a cell. And if there is a um, interaction, some form of chemical interaction between the proteins, we have an edge between them. Okay. Um, why are these networks important? So um, these proteins can be lethal or non-lethal. A lethal protein is a protein that if we would uh, switch it off in the cell, then the whole cell would die. So for instance, when is this, when is this good if we want to target, like say, cancer cells? If we know which proteins to target, then we know how to um, how to like beat cancer in this case. And there is this paper in, from 2001 where they offered the centrality lethality hypothesis and said we could actually use centrality to find these proteins that are essential for the cell to survive, which would be, of course, really nice because we don't have to experiment is this um, is a protein lethal or not. We just we can just look at the network, calculate some centrality measure. In this case, it was, was degree. And then we, um, we, we, we know which ones to target, which is way cheaper than doing it in experiments. So that's the utopian idea of all this, um, which, uh, which then, of course, got, got into, uh, was, was extended quite a lot to the literature. But I will come to this uh, in more detail in a second. So this is the kind of the empirical example that I'm going to look at a bit more. Um, but first, some a little bit of formalism when we talk about network centrality. What do we actually? Um, what what is network centrality? So from a very formal perspective, network centrality is is a function from the set of nodes to the real numbers, um, which identifies structural importance of the nodes. So how important is a node for uh, within the network? If a value is higher. If the value of uh, node i is higher than the value of node j, then we say that i is more central than j. And like in this example before, what has what has been done with this with this with these uh, numbers that we get then is basically that this is an explanatory variable. Um, for instance, we can identify lethal proteins or identify disease spreaders or popular people or whatever. So it's been used as an explanatory va uh, variable. Now the problem, of course, is that this is very that structural importance is a very ambiguous um, term. Okay, what does it mean to be structurally important for the for the network? I'm going to illustrate this a bit. The um, this ambiguity on this um, uh, like little mouse network here. If you look Wait, at there, the sorry, yeah, I, I think your your mic is like uh, rubbing your blood or something. Because oh, it's making us. Okay, sorry. Is this better? Yes, I think so. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, okay. I'm not just going to hold it then like this. Um, so this, these are the four standard centrality indices. Okay, we have degree, which just counts the number of neighbors. So in this case, node 11 has the highest degree, which is uh, five. Closeness measures the shortest distance from all nodes, sums them up, and the short, short sum of the the shortest distances is from uh, coming from node six. Between us is the number of paths that run through the node to get from one node to, to another. Okay, so the most paths basically run through eight. And eigenvector centrality is then when it becomes a bit more complicated. Um, so that the formal, uh, uh, formal way of defining it is just that it's the entry of the first eigenvector, but it's also uh, just the number of closed walks um, 
of until like uh, uh, length infinity, basically. So the, the limit proportion of those. So we have the most from seven. Okay, so we have four indices in this simple example and four different centers um, for four different centrality indices. So this is the a bit more formalism. So this is just how these indices are defined. Uh, we have the adjacency matrix where uh, we have a i j is one if two nodes are connected, and then these are the complicated formulas for for what I just um, for what I just explained. What I will add to this is uh, subgraph centrality because that has somehow also been called a standard index by now, and subgraph centrality is also just a way of uh, counting the closed uh, closed walks of length k, uh, but they are just weighted down a bit more. And I don't have the picture, but in this case, actually node 10 would be the most central. So we have five indices and five different uh, unique centers for centrality indices. Um, of course, these are, you know, these are the standard ones, or like the ones that are used quite a lot, but in my thesis, my PhD thesis, I also went along and, and gathered as many as I could find in the literature. And in the last two weeks of writing down my thesis, I thought it was, would be a cool idea to arrange them in a periodic table. Um, so this is, by now, it's also just a fraction of what has been proposed. So there are hundreds of indices that are kind of measuring structural importance in, uh, in the network. But well, structural importance is very ambiguous term, but is there still, we have to kind of, we can't just use arbitrary functions and throw them on a laptop, uh, on a laptop, on a network and, um, and then call it a centrality index. There must be something that makes a index, an index that measures structural importance. Um, there have been a lot of tries to kind of find a way to define what makes an index an index. And one of them, one of the ways is a very theoretical or technical one, uh, which is as we do in math, we try to come up with axioms that, um, that so rules that a um, index has to fulfill. And in most cases, it's, it was, it's about desired behavior under graph edits. That means an index is an index of uh, a centrality index. If, if we remove an edge, the two nodes that are attached to it should become less central, that rules like that. And there have been um, many, actually these gray ones down here, um, most of them are these, um, these, these axiomatic approaches to centrality. So also quite a lot out there. There have been also practical tries to characterize indices to say, okay, what are actually the, um, uh, try to classify indices, what are graph theoretic uh, notions on or what types of network flows do these indices measure? Uh, if they do, uh, what kind of trajectories, what's the diffusion mechanism and so forth. So trying to classify them in a way that it gets clear, okay, what are these indices maybe measuring? The problem with both approaches is the theoretical or technical ones are way too restrictive. So what happens in all these cases here is that in the end of their axiomatic uh, when they have the axiomatic system, they realize that there's only one or two indices uh, that fulfill these properties. So that would mean uh, what, what they basically give us is, an uh, is a way of axiomatizing um, single indices, but not a set of axioms for the whole uh, set of centrality indices. The classifications are just too practical to kind of um, make any, any more advanced statement of what it makes an index an index. You can tell that an index measures network flow in this and that way, and it calculates this and that trajectory, but it doesn't help us to um, delineate what makes an index an index. But so if there is no real like, like established uh, theoretical way of defining an index, how is it done? So if you, I write a paper, uh, I have a new index. How do I justify that the index is supposed to be an index? So what, what has been done here a lot is invoking an argument from Freeman who said that 
The person located in the center of a star is universally assumed to be structurally more central than any other person in any other position in any other network of similar size. So what people do is they apply the index to the star network and then say, okay, look, the most central node is the center. According to this index, um, we have fulfilled this uh, property. The second one is what was also always been done is a correlation study. So here the idea comes from uh, saying, okay, if, if I have an index and it doesn't correlate much with another index, that means I'm measuring something else than this index. That's why we can use this index now too, because we are just measuring something else. So when there's a new index, we just take some random network, correlate it with existing ones. And then um, if we don't find high correlation, perfect. We, we have a new, we can use this new index. Uh, the third part that I'm going to come to uh, now is also kind of in a practical context to say, okay, we have an index. We came up with an index, and when we apply this index to this problem, we get good results. So this should also justify why we can use this index. I've always said during my, my thesis that I'm never going to do a in, uh, do uh, come up with an index myself, but at, at one point I just I just needed to. <laughs> So this is an index that has never been published and will never be published um, the, that I called the hyper, hyperbolic index. So what it does is, um, I just try to recall it, it sums up all closed walks of even length within the neighborhood of a node and weighs them um, by the inverse factorial of the length and weighs it also by the clustering coefficient of the node. So it's a very arbitrary set of, um, set of uh, algebraic operations applied to a node. It's called hyperbolic index because this is the, also the, the series of the cosine, hype, uh, the hyperbolic cosine. So that's where the name comes from. Okay, and then we throw it at the star network, perfect. Uh, the center is the most central. It also does not correlate with other indices that well. So we have fulfilled these two, two properties. Uh, but the big question is why, why on earth, what are we actually measuring uh, in the network when we apply this weird, weird index on, 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 uh, on a network? So the, the connection between the, the technical details and what the measure is supposed to measure is completely unclear. Um, if we go back to this centrality, lethality stuff, um, over, the over time, this hypothesis thing was actually changed to a rule. So at one point, it was just kind of accepted, kind of at least in this area of research about centrality and protein interaction networks, that central proteins are the most important for its survival and became kind of a data, uh, like a, a task of... Um, um, who, can, who can come up with the index that uh, has the highest accuracy in predicting lethal proteins. And now this was, I, this is really no joke and it was really purely by coincidence that it turned out that the index that I came up with actually outperformed all the other indices by quite a lot in on standard benchmark graphs that they were using. So um, the, like the usual, benchmark was measuring how many of the lethal proteins end up in the top 100 nodes, 150 and so forth. So here's what top 150 nodes in, in one of these networks. Uh, and you can see the hyperbolic index has uh, more than two thirds of all nodes in the top 150 are actually uh, lethal proteins. And so it actually also works in a practical context. Um, so we would actually have a lot of confidence to write a paper about the hyperbolic index and why it is uh, good to have uh, this, this measure and why it makes practically sense. But um, there are just so many issues with, with this. Um, it makes, what, what this all is, it makes sense from a, from a data-driven perspective, okay? So we are just hunting for uh, the best or, from a, or predictive uh, perspective, okay? If we want to just predict lethality, um, then this is all good, okay? We just can come up with whatever method we want 
we want to want to predict it. Um, but what would actually be interesting is to get an explanation. Uh, so what what is the connection between the hyperbolic index and the biological process uh, that makes a protein um, makes a protein uh, uh, lethal for for the cell? So here um, the the focus gets completely lost. So we go completely past this uh, uh, explanatory way of uh, using centrality. And then, of course, in this case, this is the question, okay, now we have the hyperbolic index being very good in predicting this, but is it the best one? Um, uh, can we find better ones? We just simply cannot say because we can't, we don't know how many index, indices there would be to, 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 um, to come up with. And if any of these are better than the hyperbolic index. The next problem is then also, okay, if we can't find any index that can explain or predict, in this case, lethality or any other thing we want to predict, does that mean that it's just not possible to predict it? Or can we just not find um, an, an index that, that can um, predict or explain the, or predict the, the uh, phenomenon that we are looking at? And also what the example of the hyperbolic index shows is that it's in many cases very easy to come up with something with an index that performs reasonably well, so well enough to uh, publish something uh, with, with it. Okay, so now I've tapped down everything about centrality. Now I'm trying to build it up again in a different way. Um, so the current way is uh, or the, what, what I've been talking about now is we have a lot of indices. It's very unclear what these indices might actually be measuring. Um, and what is the, and more specifically, what I'm going to talk about is what is the defining property of a centrality index? So, what makes an index an index? Okay, going back to these, um, to the formulas of the standard indices, I'm just going to make some adjustments. Okay. So, we're just going to say now we have a, direct observed relation between individuals. So direct now, not in the sense of a directed edge, but a directly observed relationship. So something that we can actually observe uh, or ask people about. So friendship, for instance, are you, are you friends with B? Yes or, uh, yes or no. And that's degree is then just summing up basically these direct relations. Every other relation that we have um, for the others is a derived relation or an indirect relation. So something that we cannot measure or it's very hard to measure directly. So to, for instance, distance, we can't ask node I, how far do you think are you in the friendship network to J? So we, it's very hard for people to assess this uh, in, in, in reality, but we can indirectly measure it by concatenating uh, direct relations. And the same goes, it gets a bit more complicated, but it's technically always the same. So we have, we do some, we use the directly observed one and derive an indirect relation uh, between nodes that is then used to create an index. So we can write any centrality index in a very generic form, which is just we sum up indirect relations from a node I to all others, to all other nodes J. So the easiest to explain is the distance one. Uh, we derive as the indirect relation the distance from i to all other j's and then sum this up the inverse. It also works for, for any other index this way. So we have a very generic form for uh, centrality indices. Um, and the, the way we can define what an indirect relation is, now this is where it gets really tricky with, with math, but I'm just going to, um, um, I'm not going to, to all the details here. So I, I already said, talked about it. Um, uh, we, we try to concatenate um, the directly observed edges in a way. So we, we built trajectories in the graph. This can be paths, shortest paths and so forth. And then we aggregate over them. So for instance, when we are talking about distance, we are concatenating edges to paths. So say from six to two, Okay, and the end we have concatenated a lot of paths and then we aggregate over these paths in the sense for distance it's just looking for the path that is the shortest. Okay, so we have a set of paths that come from concatenation and then we aggregate by just 
looking at the shortest path. And uh, a, if you have a mathematical, um, like um, a mathematical object that, uh, that can, uh, is attached with two different, two different operations, concatenation and aggregation leads um, to, to something that is called a semi-ring. Um, and the definition of a semi-ring is, is just that we have a set of numbers, two operations, concatenation and aggregation, uh, neutral elements for both of these. So for instance, a neutral element of addition is uh, zero. The neutral element of multiplication is one. Um, so we have two neutral elements and these are just binary operations on these, on these numbers. And um, the, what, what, we, what we understand of a, a path algebra is then just you know, a way of defining indirect relations. So all of these indirect relations that we derive here can be defined via something that is called a path algebra. And um, this is then just a way to aggregate them. So these, these details are not, not, not that important, but these are just now, now, that, now we have a, a, a generic form of an index and we have a generic form of deriving the indices. And this is very important because if you wanna make a statement about everything, any centrality in the index, you can either make a statement about each and every single centrality index, or you try to come up with in a way that, that uh, expresses all indices at once and then you make a statement about that and so this is the way we are taking um before we continue with these forms just a, a quick interlude so this is an, an example that still comes from my time at uh, in the uk so that's why it's um it's it's uh, english as, as soccer coaches which are actually not also i should should update them i think frank lambert for instance is not and they are not the coaches anymore, but let's say they are still the coaches of these clubs and um, they have like values attached to their, how good they are in dealing with offense, defense, tactics, and their general charisma. Okay, so these are just, um, let's say features of these coaches. And now we wanna know which of these three coaches is the best coach. What we also know is, how much weight we should put on all these categories. So tactics is the most important and charisma is the least important. Uh, how, now, of course, the natural way of, 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 of how we would rank these, these coaches now is uh, we could do a weighted sum. So we just multiply the weight with the values and then sum everything up. What would happen then is they would find out that Guardiola and Frank Lampert are uh, equally good, but they are better than Ancelotti. Now there's also a different way of ranking them that would be the weighted product. And if we apply the weighted product, what we would find is suddenly that Ancelotti is the best coach, Guardiola is the, is the second best and Lampard is the, the, the worst. So a similar problem basically what we have for um, centrality indices, okay, it depends depending on what measure we apply, we will end up with a different way of ranking these, these uh, coaches. And there's actually in this, in this string of research, there's a, the, um, is it called ranking paradox? I'm not sure if, if, if that's the word, but um, so the paradox is that in order to find the best way of, of rank, uh, the best ranking method, you need the best ranking method to rank the, the ranking methods. Okay, so it's basically impossible to find a, the best type of way to rank uh, a set of objects, in this case, soccer coaches. So we might not be able to rank them in a way that is unique, but we can find uh, parts of the ranking that will always be the same. Okay, so now we added a, a fourth one, Jurgen Klopp, who is still coach at um, Liverpool. And these are his values. And if you compare um, now his values, say for offense, he has a higher offense value than all of them. He has a better defense value than all of them. He has a better tactics value than all of them. And he has higher charisma than all of them. So his values are higher in every category. And this then also already intuitively would tell you, okay, no matter how we aggregate these, 
and how those three are ranked uh, internally, we always we will always know that Jurgen Klopp is going to be ranked on top of them because he just in this case uh, even used the term dominates all of them. Okay, so this is the, the the concept. We don't know what the correct ranking is, but we know Jurgen Klopp will always be ranked higher than these three. And this is a concept that we found actually also existing in networks. And um, this is called neighborhood inclusion. So it's it's almost a one-to-one -one correspondence to, to what we had here. So Ewing Club has better values than all of them in each category. And here, a, a, a node uh, V dominates a node U. If all the neighbors of U are also neighbors of V, but V has additional neighbors, okay? So U is connected to this node and to this node. V is also connected to this node, but he has additional, or they have additional um, uh, neighbors, okay? So this is the form of dom domination that we can observe in networks. And so this is what we found. What we found, this is the, a, a, a form of domination that is preserved for all centrality indices that can be expressed in this general form that we uh, that I just presented. Okay, so if the neighborhood of V uh, of U is included in the neighborhood of V, then we know that in any centrality ranking, the node V will always be ranked higher than the node U. Um, I'm going to skip the proof idea because it's not important. It's just uh, that this is that this is that it can be proven uh, and and it is uh, thus a, a general property of nodes in the network. So what does it what does it mean or what are the implications of this of this very general result now? So there is a a partial order or in this case I call it the pre-order. So some nodes are where this dominance relation exists in a network, they will always be ranked in the same uh, order for any type of centrality index. That also means if we, if in a graph or in a network, if we pick two, whatever, whatever two nodes, and there is neighborhood inclusion there, uh, then there is only exactly one centrality ranking um, possible. So no matter what index we use, we will always get the same um, ranking in the network. And these graphs are known as uh, threshold graphs. So you see here an example, and here the rankings. Uh, you see there are no, uh, no crossings, so there are no pairs that are differently ranked. There's just between this is the odd one out in the sense that um, some, uh, some uh, ranks collapse to, to one rank. Um, but this is not a contradiction to to, um, to what I just presented. Uh, it's just a form of, uh, so all of these indices um, um, preserve a neighborhood inclusion in a, in a strict way and between us does it in a non-strict way, but it does not change the results for between us. It's still everything valid. And between us is the only index, at least so far uh, where this is the case. Okay. What are further implications? So actually the using correlation to say that an index um, measures something different than another index does not make any sense because it, what, what was implied is that the, the correlation depends on the definition of the indices. But for instance, in this network, say betweenness and closeness, have always been seen as complementary indices. So one would say, okay, they are not highly correlated, they measure different things. But in threshold graphs, they actually measure exactly the same thing. So they also have the same, same ranking, of course, with this uh, rank collapsing thing, but it doesn't make a difference, okay? So um, the correlation actually does only depend on the network structure. So in, in, a, in a very simple way is the more uh, the more pairs are compared are compared by the neighborhood inclusion, uh, the more um, pres like, the more the ranking is already predetermined before we throw any index on it, um, and the less pairs are comparable, the more degrees of freedom there exist to rank 
nodes different. So the correlation has very little to do with the definition of the indices, but way more with the um, network structure. So this is just what I, what I, what I, what I said. Um, and so what, what the, the, the real conclusion from this technical work is now that we have a way of defining what makes a, an index a centrality index. And that is just any function or any index that preserves this neighborhood inclusion pre-order. So whenever a node U is dominated by the node V, its centrality value, so the value of V should always be higher than the one from U. If this is not the case, then uh, the index does not fulfill this property and it is not an, a measure of centrality in our sense, of course. Um, so this is the technical, technical background. What are the implications for, for empirical work? Uh, this is the part that is still um, the, a bit, they are, we haven't done any real big empirical studies with this, uh, with this, this um, technical results because it's really hard um, to apply these very theoretical results in any empirical settings. But there are, from this technical results, we could at least derive already some um, new ways of measuring or assessing centrality that does not rely on using indices. So for one thing, we could say, okay, we are just looking, we are starting with a, like a partial centrality analysis. That means we just look at the neighborhood inclusion order. So in this case, we see that there's a link from a node to another one in this network. If the neighborhood of the node is included in the, uh, or if the node is dominated by the other node. So for instance, neighborhood of one is 11, six is also connected to 11, but to a bunch more. So one is dominated by six. Uh, two's neighborhood is four, eight's neighborhood is four, but also more. So um, two is dominated by, uh, by eight. And these, this is where these lines come from. So this is a new type of network basically that we can work with. And what we can do with this, this network is to assess, okay, what is the maximum rank a node can achieve in a centrality index ranking and what's the minimum uh, ranking it can achieve. So for instance, node two will always be ranked below these two. So technically the most central it can, can be is ranked on number three because it cannot be compared with all the others. So it can be ranked higher than all these other nodes uh, in the best case. In the worst case, since it does not nom dominate anyone else, um, it will be ranked last. And this is then what, what defines a rank interval. So these are the intervals for each node. What are the feasible positions in the centrality ranking a node can have? And the color ones are the positions in the rankings given from degree between its closeness, eigenvector, and uh, subgraph centrality. The wider an interval is, the more degrees of freedom exist for a node to be ranked differently. Okay, so for instance, node 10 could be anywhere from the most central node to almost the least central one. So this is kind of to assess, to say, okay, this network we are looking at, it's really hard to find any effect of centrality indices because, okay, we find an index where 10 is ranked the highest. So for subgraph centrality, but we also find an index between the centrality where it's almost the least central one. Okay, so that's then really important to actually make an argument. Why would we use subgraph centrality? And this argument has to be um, attached to the meaning of like the theoretical meaning what is subgraph centrality actually measuring so this has to be clear and this connection between what subgraph centrality is measuring to the empirical phenomenon that we are looking at so this is a way to kind of call out uh, this this type of that we have to apply this reasoning now one could assume, okay, now we know all the ranks and the ranks of the nodes for centrality rankings actually appear uh, uniformly 
on this uh, in this interval. So say the probability for node 10 to be the most central is equal to the probability to be the almost least central. But this is not the not the case. So from this partial uh, um, order that we obtain here, the neighborhood inclusion, we can look at all, we can actually find out what, how many rankings exist that fulfill this um, partial order. So how many possible centrality rankings are there? So for this very small network, we find that there are almost 800,000 possibilities to create a centrality ranking for a, for a network with 11 nodes. And once you have calculated all these rankings, simply count uh, how often does node one uh, appear as the most central or the least central and so forth. And that's when you, how you get probability distributions of the ranks of nodes. So in this case, it's always the higher the value. So this, every plot is for a node and the higher the value on the um, X axis, uh, the more central a node is. So the most central node has, has rank 11 in this case. So the probability that node one is the least central node is very high. Uh, so we have a lot of confidence to say node one is absolutely not central to this network. Uh, node nine and 10 have uniform probabilities for most ranks. So you cannot really say anything about these nodes. Another thing that is, in, but can be important in, in empirical work is then to look at relative rank probabilities. That would just be if you are interested in, say, uh, a pair of nodes, say two nodes, what is the uh, probability that when we apply a centrality index that one node is more central than the other? Okay, so here we have, um, for instance, for node one has a probability of two third to be less central than node two. It has a probability of one, so always will be ranked below three. Uh, and so forth. So it has a very high probabilities everywhere to be ranked below everyone. Um, probabilities like here, four and eight, when it's 0 0.5, then you can like really throw a coin and say, they, you cannot say which one is more central. Um, the, the probability is just, uh, it's, it's basically a coin flip, which one is more central. And this is very helpful if you are really just interested in uh, a handful of nodes to assess the centrality of the or the importance of the these nodes. And of course, when you have probability distributions like that, you can always also calculate the expected uh, rank of nodes in a centrality ranking, uh, which itself then uh, kind of gives a centrality ranking. So the highest, the node with the highest expected rank in the network is node eleven. Uh, then node five, eight, four, uh, and so forth. So these are now, uh, it, it was not a very, so it was on a very like um, a toy example, um, but uh, this is kind of the way how one could, what, what one could do in empirical uh, research instead of applying indices. So looking from a more probabilistic way at the data. Okay, um, that was it. For, for this, just to recap a bit, um, the first part I was talking of, about the foundations of centrality. So deriving derived a generic form of indices, so a, a way of expressing each index in the same way in order to make very general statements about the whole concept of, of centrality, which was used then to show, okay, there is this dominance relation in networks that is always preserved by centrality rankings with which we can work uh, in different ways then um, for, for centrality. The implications are that some or many of the assumptions that have been put on centrality indices just don't hold anymore. So there are actually ways. Uh, that, so for instance, correlation is not indicative for indices to be uh, measuring something different in networks. And uh, this, this, this technical results leads to um, new forms of actually assessing centrality. So this would this partial and probabilistic way of, of measuring centrality uh, where the methods are there, but there hasn't been a, uh, a proper um, empirical analysis yet with it. Okay, that was it. Thanks for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions.
Thank you very much, David. That, that was great and very interesting. Uh, um, anyone has any question? You can go ahead and just uh, unmute yourself. I have some questions, David, but unfortunately, because my background is not this, I'm more asking if some of the questions in my mind could be, um, you know, digging into them, if, if this type of analysis would be useful. So as a, you know, as someone who's doing uh, cancer research, a couple of questions like uh, on a physiological level, we know that the microenvironment um, of uh, cancer cells are affected uh, by physical activity, but they haven't really figured out exactly how, because it's a collection of things. Um, we know on a implementation, when we look to implement physical activity of cancer survivors, that there are, there are key players in that clinical team that have an impact. Um, when we look at symptom clusters, there are some clusters that are kind of the leaders that, that really are disruptive and kind of drag everyone around. Um, so I guess, are those questions that would be appropriate to start using something like uh, looking at um, measures of centrality um, or is that totally inappropriate? Because a lot of times people are just shooting darts at one part and we're missing all of the other parts and the, the synergy. And this is just, again, I'm very naive to this. So please bear with me while I ask those questions. Oh, good. These are good. These are good questions. So, and actually, good questions because what I, um, so what, what I see very often in when centrality is applied to to any form of empirical analysis, it's there's never, never really any like thought put into uh, does this what I'm what I'm using now this index does it actually. Uh, would this actually measure what I want to do? It's mostly the case of, oh, there are 20 indices that are implemented in this package. I just throw them all on the data. And then I take the one that, that fits my rationale the best. And then I write a paper, say, look, between this uh, explains uh, phenomenon X in the network. Uh, and this is unfortunately still, this is just how centrality is used. And it's, um, it's, really hard to change anything there um also like when this way when you're with the, the things you are you are talking about it's really hard to say if the methods that i'm uh, that i propose are working in a certain in a certain empirical setting then again so that's why there is since so this framework exists now since eight years or so and since eight years we're trying to find any form of empirical example where this would actually so what needs to be shown is centrality indices do not lead to anything but if we apply this framework then we get something and that something explains also something so it could be that all this is technically uh, theoretically really nice but just impractical so it's really hard for me to always say to, to say okay this is a good example or not so it, 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 the the devil's in the detail usually to to say okay this here it could work um uh, so it's it's without kind of the seeing the data it's really hard to say if something would work or not thank you any other questions around Yeah, I, I do, if you guys permit, I do have a couple of comments and questions. I think that the, what you were the, trying to recall was the, the Condorcet paradox for the ranking, right? I think that's, that's the one. Mm. Uh, now, and, and regarding the, the, the protein centrality, like the protein networks, I think that, yeah, so today, uh, a pathway analysis and that kind of stuff is, is very, is, is still like highly active in research. But I think that, uh, the way that I see it, centralized measurements and, and, and things alike in general, they might not give you the ultimate right answer, but, but they actually at least help you organize and direct the, the, like the focus. Because we have so many genes and so many like proteins that we can look at. Uh, let's just look at the ones that it might seem that may do something. So at, at the very least, that's something that that we could do. But I, I wanted to ask you, so what, what are your thoughts about um, uh, uh, using confidence intervals in, in, in centrality measurements because I think that 
we do have uh, uh, Schneider's and Borgari's uh, bootstrap uh, algorithm to compute the confidence intervals, but I haven't seen it used that much. And maybe by using that, for example, we could uh, identify properties like the one that you mentioned that in in, uh, in some cases you may observe ties between nodes and centralized measurements. So how, what's your thought about it and what, what have you looked at? Yeah, yeah just a, a quick comment to the, the so the protein stuff that I have that, that has advanced a lot since I started uh, wor working on that. But I think the in the most the biggest issue in it is when you actually talk to um, practitioners who are dealing with making experiments with protein interactions is that this <coughs> sorry these networks are just unreliable. So uh, interactions actually do not exist, or uh, it's 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 not a static thing. So that's mostly the issue that practitioners have with that. Um, the, the the thing I, I I like really like the the Bogatti Snyder thing, and I think we need to use more uh, measures of uncertainty for for centrality. To not say okay, we have now this is the betweenness um, ranking we we get and we use it, but we need to say confidence intervals um, or actually what I'm working now on a paper is measures on a graph level that say how uh, well, how good a centrality index is um, explaining something based on certain graph properties. So is this what we what we see, um, what we get from a centrality index? Is this something that actually comes from the index or is already coming from, from the network structure? So I think we need this more, um, but these things are as these, probabilistic stuff it's just really hard to kind of apply in a way that is convincing then i think this is uh that just needs to be one application be this also for these for these confidence intervals or this now that gives a compelling argument for using these that goes beyond the technical arguments that we are making there's a question in the chat uh, mm -hmm. uh, no. by dr zamar so what are the implications for choosing network interventions? Um, okay, so this is unfortunately a topic that I am, uh, I, I, I have too little knowledge about network interventions. Um, I think it's, it has, the thing has implications in any, domain of network analysis where centrality is used. Um, I, I probably it is used in network interventions. Um, I, I, I mean, good thing that Tom Valente is not here. Um, <laughs> he would say something well, about well, it now. What would he, yeah, exactly. What would he say? Oh, okay. <laughs> that, that, that's what I'm asking you to, I'm asking you oh, to okay. ch channel <laughs> Tom Valente. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I, I honestly, this is unfortunately not my type of uh, expertise, so I cannot say anything about it. But if there are centrality measures being used, then it's certainly something that where this also would have implications for. Yes, yeah, so I, I think that the, the biggest issue here is that when you are thinking about social networks and interventions, is that you don't have a single unique graph that you can look at. Uh, you have the friendship network, the leader network, the the advice seeking network, so it, it, it all, and they can give you very different structures. Um, uh, uh, Tom has used a lot of the, uh, I think it's uh, degree centrality measurements for network interventions, but uh, but in those cases, he will he will ask directly, for example, when he works a lot with uh, with uh, high schools and, uh, and students. Uh, uh, who who you see as a leader? So he will look directly at the leadership network. Um, uh, but I, and and I think that it, uh, also that I don't know. This is kind of like a question slash comment because it seems that we are looking at this centrality measurements over the graph. But in, in social networks, we we not only have a graph, we have behavior too. So I think you have to also consider that. So you're measuring centrality for what? What are you, what you are thinking about, like diffusion of a behavior, or uh, like a, or or communication, or, or 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 like network control? When you're thinking about negative networks, you want to like break uh, uh, Al Qaeda's network, and 
So, so it will it very it will depend very much on what right. you're looking at uh, and a second. Right. How about just stop pandemics? Can we just do that, please? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could have done that with this. Then I think uh, everyone would do it now. Right. Now, it's this is a very good point that you bring up. That so centrality. With this, I haven't talked about that, but in in. Uh, just quickly go there to the generic form so if you look at the generic form there's there's so many implicit assumptions in here so saying that the relations we have calculated are actually it's possible to aggregate them and it also means that a relation to an actor j has the same value as a relation to actor k so it does not take and it, it, con, uh, it considers everyone to be homogeneous in the network but um this might not be the case, okay? So there might be relations that, depending on the phenomenon you're looking at, it's more important to be connected with a doctor than with uh, a, a athlete or so. So they should actually be separated as, uh, or looked at differently when we look at uh, being important in the network. And this is the, the implicit assumption of centrality and is always everyone is has the same value in this network and no one... It's, it's it's not more important to be connected to someone or not someone and this is when this where this when we look at use this partial approach so this is then something that Ulrich could now talk um, talk a lot about is um, how we can how this is like this is a very a very heterogeneous a, a very a way of looking at nodes without putting any assumptions on them the only assumption is that someone has more relations than another, the same relations and a little bit more. And um, there is no, we, we can now build up on this and uh, create further dominance relations that are then based on groups of nodes um, and, and, and work that way again without summation. But this is something, so if you are interested in that, uh, the paper is called Network Positions. Uh, by Ulrich Brandes in uh, Methodological Innovations Journal. So this expands on this, this idea and that not everyone should be treated the same way uh, also when it comes to centrality. Awesome, thank you. Uh, any last question? Uh, I'm not sure if this is a short question or not. Thank you for the talk, that was very interesting. I'm wondering, can this type of unifying theory for uh, centrality measures be used to determine which centrality measures might be correlated for different networks? Or also since one of uh, the pain points oftentimes with network theory is the computational expense, could this perhaps be used to determine if you want a specific centrality measure, but it would be too computationally expensive on a particular network, could you use this kind of thing to find a substitute centrality measure that you could say would, would just be highly correlated? Yeah, this, uh, thanks for bringing that one up. I missed that part. He, where was that? Um, here, the correlation. Uh, so this is the way if, uh, there's a, an interesting way of when high correlations are found, then this is actually the argument then being made, say, okay, we are highly correlated with between us, but ours is computationally less expensive. So we can use ours in, um, in exchange with, with between us, which seems like a good argument, but um, this is an also a paper that I'm working on now to strengthen this, um, this result, sorry, it goes a bit long, this, okay that um, we, we actually came up with a, with a network generator that generates networks where you can throw in two centrality indices and you can get out a network where they are super highly correlated and super not correlated, okay? So negatively correlated. So just to say that there are, no matter what, in the, how close two indices, um, no matter how close you think two indices are, you can always build a network where they are very uh, little correlated. So this cor correla using correlation to justify indices one over another is very dangerous because um, it can go both ways. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Darit. Uh, so uh, great talk.
and, and we recorded it. If you're okay with it, we'll, we'll like to upload it to our website. Sure. And I'll share the, the, the recording later on. So thank you very much again. Thank you so thank much. Thank you for having me. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.